Hello. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, for our next talk, um, I'm not sure if we're going to talk back end or front end, but um, I'm sure be prepared for some live action JavaScript magic. Felix Geisendorfer. Thank you. Uh, audio working for everybody? People in the back row? Nobody hears me? Do I need to get closer? Oh my god, this will be uncomfortable. Um, if I move away from the microphone and you can't hear me, just wave a hand or something. So far, so good? OK, let's try this. So yeah, um, sorry about the hooking computer things up. It's, it used to work on Macs. Now it's not working anymore. Um, this talk is the uh, Sand of Node.js. And um, before I get started, a few words about myself. My name is uh, Felix Geisendorfer, uh, at Felix Xi on Twitter. Uh, I came to Node.js through uh, startups that I did, or still doing. Uh, it's called transloaded.com. We do file uploads and video encoding. Uh, we started doing that with PHP, actually. And while we were developing it, we found that PHP was OK, but some of the things we wanted to do, uh, espe especially executing other programs, was really hard to do with PHP. And around this time, a new software platform came out called Node.js. And it seemed really cool for what we wanted to do. The only problem was it was young, new software. And so I ended up with this. Uh, I had to become a contributor and actually go in and fix a lot of things uh, just to make the platform work for us. Um, if I had known how much work that would have been, I may not have gone down that route. But here I am, and it, it worked out all right. Uh, we're doing well. Um, so nowadays, I'm not doing so much on the Node Core anymore, but I'm still writing these Node modules. Uh, I've got a bunch of them up, uh, probably the two that you would see if you're going to do node development is this one, Node Formidable. Uh, this one is for handling file uploads. And Node MySQL, this one's actually a JavaScript implementation of the MySQL protocol. Um, so, so much for me. Uh, I don't know you guys, so let me ask a few questions. How many of you would consider yourself JavaScript developers? OK, cool. Uh, so the people who are ashamed can also raise their hands. It's OK. Um, so what else? How many of you have heard about Node.js before? OK, that's most people. Cool. Um, and is anybody using Node.js? Cool, a few people. Very nice. Um, so I guess most people have heard all of this, so I'm going to keep it very, very short. Just a little bit about Node's history. This guy created it. His name is Ryan Dahl. Uh, he started working on it sometime in February 2009 and released the project a few months later. Um, when he first released it, nobody really seemed to jump onto it. I mean, the mailing list slowly gathered momentum. But when I joined, it was still number 24. It was slowly growing. It was not exploding. But then this happened. Um, on November 7, 2009, Ryan gave what was probably the best talk uh, ever given about Node.js. Um, and uh, he was introducing it to people for the first time in a wider audience. And he got people super excited about it. Uh, it was the first and only time I've seen somebody doing a technical presentation and getting standing ovations. And so I really hate doing these Node.js introduction talks because this talk is not to be beaten. Um, anyway, so at that point, Node actually exploded. People were like, this is really cool. This is what we should do. He had like this revolution uh, going for him. And in 2012, a bunch of companies ended up doing Node. Uh, in one way or another, they're involved with the project. And this is where the project is now. Um, so what's my goal for this talk? Uh, my goal for this talk is basically just to get people excited about Node.js. And instead of showing you a bunch of boring slides and telling you how non-blocking I.O. is uh, magic from the future, I'll simply show you some code and I'll try to do some live coding. Um, so enough slides and uh, let's try to do some live coding. And let's hope the demo gods are good for me today. Um, would anybody be confused about installing Node.js? OK, then. Let's not start there. So there's a website. You can download an installer. And this is going to give you Node.js. You just click through the menus. Um, once you've installed it, uh, creating your first Node program is as simple as going to say, uh, open a file, call it test.js or something, and type in console hello world. Uh, so this is all there is. And you can execute it by running Node. That's the name of the Node program. And it's the name, uh, file you want to execute. So what's Node? Node is just basically a JavaScript uh, 
environment where you can run JavaScript files, you can run them on your computer, you can run them on a browser, uh, but you don't get any of that HTML crap. You don't get the DOM, you just get the JavaScript crap, which is bad enough. So um, hopefully we'll find some reasons to do that. But uh, the only thing that Node really adds on top of pure JavaScript uh, is bindings for networking and for the file system uh, so you can actually do stuff. So JavaScript itself uh, was chosen as a platform by Ryan basically for one reason. Uh, well, two reasons, really. One reason is it's one of the few languages that doesn't have a standard library. So pretty much every other language out there is defined together with a standard library. Everything, every language has a function to open a file, to write to a file, to do socket programming, all kinds of stuff. JavaScript doesn't do that. And so it's really good for the uh, evented, non-blocking programming style that we're going to see in a bit. The second reason was uh, Google at the time when uh, Ryan had this idea came out with uh, Google Chrome and with Google Chrome they released a new JavaScript engine called V8 and V8 was uh, finally a wake-up call for all the JavaScript implementers to get faster. I think when they came out they were massively faster than everybody else and then people were like, oh my god, we need to get faster this JavaScript thing. And because of that, now we have uh, five top-notch JavaScript engines. Major corporations are putting a lot of money behind making JavaScript faster. Um, and it, as far as dynamic programming languages go, JavaScript ranks very high up as being one of the fastest. And well, Google released the libraries that made it easy to embed it. So these two things came together, really, uh, that made Ryan use Node. So now let's look at how can we do web stuff with this. Um, or is actually anybody not doing web programming here? We're all stuck with web programming, maybe a few exceptions. Uh, but so let's look at this web programming thing right away. Um, so Node is a little different than other platforms. In other platforms, uh, you would usually be embedded inside of some kind of web server that then calls up your code. So you would write your application, and then something comes and calls it. So in PHP, that could be Apache. Uh, in Python, that could be some web server, Ruby, Mongrel, in Java, some Tomcat. Uh, in Node, this is kind of inverted. Instead, you would always come and create your own web server. You would create your own container in your program. So what you would do is you would include this HTTP module, as we're doing on line one here. And then you would say, HTTP, uh, create me a web server, please. Um, and then it's going to take a function. We're going to talk about this in a second. And uh, then what you would do is you would start listening uh, on a certain port. So instead of having some web server already running uh, or installed somewhere, you're responsible for setting this thing up yourself. What's kind of cool about this is that you don't really need a lot of gear to deploy a Node program. It's the only thing that needs to be installed on the server is Node.js, and then you can create your own web server, listen on the port. Uh, it's a little bit simpler to deploy than some other stuff. Um, so what, what's the deal with this uh, callback function here? Uh, is everybody familiar with callbacks in JavaScript, how that stuff works? Is anybody not familiar? OK, so <laughs> at least one person is willing to admit. Um, so just a quick idea what this does. This calls a function called create server. And the argument to that function itself is actually a function. So we're passing a function around like a value. And what happens is every time somebody connects to this web server and makes a request, this function that we've been passing in here is being called. So just to prove that this is happening, we could print out the request URL here uh, every time we are called. And we could run this web server. And we could hit it up on port 8080. And now we're going to see it's going to be called with a slash URL. Or we could do something else, like, oops. I think this worked. Google Chrome is just being weird. Um, so we have slash dot test. So every time we get a request in, this uh, function is being called. And now what we can do is we can, uh, instead of just console locking something, uh, we can return a response. So we could say, uh, response.end test, and that should return test to our request. So it doesn't matter which URL we hit the thing, it's going to reply test. Now, a lot of people initially got excited about Node because in a situation like this, like Hello World, just printing some single, simple string, Node is really, really fast. It can do like 6,000 requests a second on a, on a single uh, processor, and it scales linearly with uh, processors if you've got one process for each CPU. And it's kind of cool. Uh, I don't know. I don't write too much Hello World stuff, uh, or at least I don't have a Hello World app in production. 
So um, maybe we should look at something a little bit more interesting. And so as an example I was thinking about for today is to write a little chat application. And this chat application would allow people to post images, only images. Um, I think it has been done before, it's called 4chan, and we know only good things can come out of this. Um, so let's try what happens if we do it here. I don't think anybody can connect to this network, so we should be on the safe side. But if somebody figures this out, it's going to be fun. Um, so let's try to write this thing. Let's try to create, oh, by the way, if somebody like gets stuck and everything sounds boring after the next words, uh, feel free to interrupt, get the microphone, and ask a question. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, so let's start creating our little chat application. So for the chat application, uh, I'm not going to use a built-in HTTP server. Uh, I'm going to use Express, which is a web, frame, web framework. And Express actually helps us with a lot of the tasks that we would have to do by hand if we wouldn't use that library. Um, and the other library I'm going to use is called Socket.io. And Socket.io is actually a pretty neat library. What it does is it gives you web sockets, but it gives you web sockets that work even on older browsers. So, uh, say, web sockets, is anybody not familiar with web sockets? Uh, a few people. So, web sockets are basically uh, the new HX thing everybody's talking about. Uh, so, instead of now being able to make requests to the server from JavaScript, we are now also able to make requests to the browser from the server. So we actually have a two-way connection that's persistent between a browser and a server. And not only can we push data to our server at any given time, we can also receive data from our server at any given time. So it's a persistent connection. The problem is that not all browsers that people still use have this implemented. So Socket.io makes sure that if an older browser connects to your website, it uses something that works in this older browser. So this could be uh, actually HX and just polling over and over again. It could be Flash, it could be some iframe hacks. I mean, it does a lot of unholy things to make this web thing work and this web thing. Um, so we're going to use that as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to get Express, and I do need the other S here, and we're going to get Socket.io. So those are two modules that we're going to require. Those two modules, unlike the HTTP module I showed you earlier, are not part of Node.js. They are part of an uh, ecosystem uh, that's run by NPM. Does uh, anybody not know what NPM is? A few people. So NPM is uh, Node Package Manager. Uh, what it, if you use Ruby, it would be it's the same as Ruby Gems um, or with PHP, uh, what's it called? Uh, I forgot. Anyway. Um, you, you can basically go and say npm install me something and it will put this stuff uh, in your project. So first we would have to create a folder called node modules and then we could say npm please install us express and socket.io and this will go out to the npm registry uh, and download these modules for us and install them. Um, Anybody can publish these modules. There is very little bureaucracy. All you need to do is create a new uh, project, put it on GitHub, and then uh, you create a package.json file. There's documentation on this, but it's a really simple file. And then you would, all you would do is npm publish. So it actually levels the playing field. And I think we're now above 10,000 modules or something. So people have been writing these things rather quickly. Anyway, what this just did is inside the node modules folder we created, we now have Express and Socket.io installed. And unlike some other platforms, uh, these are locally installed. So they are in our project directory. They are not globally installed. This has the advantage that if we uh, run multiple projects on our computer uh, that have these modules as dependencies in different versions, there's not going to be a conflict. Uh, in fact, NPM would even be so smart that if you have two modules requiring a third module, but in different versions, it would also be able to figure that out. So you're pretty flexible with it. Um, Anyway, enough about NPM. Let's get back to our little chat application. Um, oops. So what we would need to do now is we would need to tell uh, Express to create a little app for us, uh, which is just uh, a container that we can define our routes on uh, where we're going to handle request. Uh, so we're going to say app equals Express. So next thing we're going to say, uh, we want to get an HTTP server for that. So this is done by saying app listen 8080. This is fairly similar to what we did earlier, just the uh, way Express does it. And then last but not least, we want to get a socket.io object. And this is created by saying uh, socket.io. Oops. 
uh, listen on our HTTP server. So every time a socket IO request, a web socket connection comes in, uh, socket IO will handle that. Um, so the, the simplest thing we could do to make sure this works is to simply define a route. And does anybody know Sinatra or similar frameworks? Anybody knows this? Okay, so uh, for those who are not familiar with it, Sinatra is a really lightweight um, Ruby web framework that inspired a lot of other web frameworks out there. And the main idea is that you quickly define some route, so some URLs that you want to execute certain code for, and uh, that is all the framework really does for you. You would say, I want to handle get requests to slash, and I want to be called when these requests come in and handle them. So it's really just a glorified router. It can do more things like middleware and uh, other things, but th this is a simple explanation. So instead of uh, previously when we had the HTTP server, where we would have had to look at the U request URL and do our own routing, this will do it for us. Um, so now we can say on this uh, slash URL, uh, we're going to return test again, and now let's run this. Chat.js seems to work. Um, so we're getting test again. However, what's different, if we hit a URL that we haven't defined, we would get a proper 404. So that's a little bit better. So to get our chat uh, bootstrap, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to create a static index.html file uh, that we're going to operate on and send some JavaScript files that are going to do some stuff for us. Um, so we're going to get rid of this route, but instead we're going to tell Express to use a middleware uh, that's going to serve static files. Um, so Express has the built-in ability to deliver files on your file system, just like Apache would do for you or Nginx would. Uh, however, I would not use it in production. You would probably want to use a content delivery network or something. Uh, anyway, so we would say, Express, please serve ourselves some static files. And we want uh, the directory to be our current directory, where this file is in, and then slash public. So in our directory here, we would create a folder called public, and this is where it would look for static files to be served. Um, that should be really it. If we now go into public and we create an index.html file, uh, Express should be able to serve that. So let's create HTML here. Um, and we're going to create a shitty invalid XML document because nobody really cares. Um, and we're going to give it a title. We're going to call it chat. Um, and uh, maybe some headline. It shows us if this is working. And now we're going to start our server again, hit this thing, and we're going to have that static file being delivered for us. OK, not really exciting. So let's get some JavaScript in. Uh, for that, let's create a directory inside of public called JS. Um, so the first thing I want to do there is I want to copy jQuery in. Uh, I already have a version of jQuery here, so I'm going to copy that in, uh, in the JS folder. So in public JS, we now have jQuery. And the next thing we want to do is we want to create a main.javascript file. In this main.javascript file, actually, uh, anybody in, hasn't done any jQuery before? few people but I so for those who haven't uh, this basically uh, is a callback again and this one executes when our document has finished loading so once all the stuff has reached uh, uh, our browser from the web server this is when this fires um, to see if this is working we're just gonna put in hello world and uh, the next thing we need to do we actually need to reference these JavaScript files uh, in our HTML file so we're gonna create some script tags uh, we're going to include JS jQuery, and we're going to include our main.js file. And now we'll see that it doesn't work if I don't start the server first. Uh, we're starting the server. This thing loads up, and in our console here, it's printing hello world. So, so far, so good. Um, now let's do some stuff with WebSockets. Uh, the first thing that we could do to try um, if the WebSocket connection is working is to broadcast the current time from our server to the client. So every 500 milliseconds or something, we're going to send down a timestamp. So doing that in Node.js is pretty simple. We're going to set up an interval. So that is a function that uh, fires every 500 milliseconds right here. And in this function, we want to say IO. Uh, sockets. So this means all connected clients, everybody who has this web uh, page open. Uh, we want to send you a message. We want to send you the time, and the time is date.now. 
So this is what we're going to execute on the server every 500 milliseconds. And now we need to uh, include socket IO in our HTML as well. Um, this file is not really on our file system. This is handled by the socket IO uh, dot listen and then the server thing in our, uh, I'll show that in a second, but it's basically handled by the socket IO library. It is serving the socket IO file. Um, let me show you. This thing right here internally will respond to this request uh, and serves the socket IO file. But now that we have the socket IO file uh, included here, we can use socket IO on the client side. So let's try that. Uh, public uh, JS main. We want to create a new socket IO connection. So we would say io.connect http slash localhost, uh, whatever. And then we want to get an event whenever one of these time messages from our server is being sent to our browser. So we're going to define a callback for that. Uh, we're going to get the timestamp as an argument. And that what we want to do is we want to take that header element and just update the text of that with our timestamp. OK, so if we now run our chat and we refresh this, uh, we should have a continuously updating uh, timestamp. Not really impressive, but it at least shows us that uh, we're getting some data from our server. Uh, one kind of fun thing to do is we could um, set a really low interval here, like every 10 milliseconds, and start this again. And as you can see, it's actually possible to send quite some data through these uh, WebSocket connections. You probably couldn't fire off one HX request uh, every 10 milliseconds without all your fans going crazy, whereas WebSockets are a little bit better for that use case. Um, so now let's try to use uh, uh, Express to uh, define a route that lets us post images. And instead of posting full images, we're just going to post the URL of it. So let's go in here. Let's get rid of this uh, broadcast thing. And let's say app post. So if somebody posts to our URL slash image, we want this function to be called. Uh, we get a request and response object again. In order for uh, form submissions post data to work in Express, we actually need to tell it. So we need to say, Express, please use a body parser um, and actually look at the data that is being part of a post request. This is pretty much available to you on most other platforms, like in PHP. You wouldn't even think about it. PHP would be, here's your request, and here's all the data that came with it. Whereas in Node, you, you get a lot of modularity. So if you don't want to do something, it's probably not going to happen by default. Most libraries are really composable, and you can bring as much or as little functionality in as you want. Um, so in this case, we do have to bring the body parser on. And then what we want to do is every time somebody sends us an image, we want to broadcast it. So we would be io.sockets emit, then we would give it, uh, call that our image, and then we would take the request body URL. And uh, we also are a good web server and we send our client a uh, nice response. So we're going to send it a 204 header, which means uh, no content, which is going to acknowledge that this request worked. And we're going to call end. And oops. And that's it. So every time somebody posts uh, to the slash image URL and has a form field called URL, we're going to broadcast that URL to all the connected browsers in our WebSocket thing. Um, so let's try that. Before we can actually do it, we need to also write some front end code for it. Um, so on the front end, we're going to change our socket listener here to wait for an image. And it's going to give us the URL. And we're going to uh, programmatically create an image tag with jQuery. Uh, so we're going to be like, give me an image tag, please. And this image tag is supposed to have a source attribute. And the source attribute is supposed to have our URL. Um, and the next thing we would want to do is we want to make this visible. Right now, that image element just exists somewhere in memory, not really doing anything. So we want to prepend it to our body element. So the newest image will always go up front. So body prepend image and okay if we're lucky this could work so we're going to start this nothing happens because we first need to uh, send an uh, send an image through here so what we're going to do is we're going to use curl for now because we don't really have a web interface to post the image so we're going to be uh, curl i want you to post to localhost 8080 and I want you to post to slash image. And I want to send some form fields with the F parameter. And we're going to say ul equals. And now we need an image. Um, 
I did have a funny image earlier on, so let's use that. Uh, so let's use this image URL right here, and that seems to have worked. Um, so every time we post this, uh, the image is going to arrive in our browser. Um, so we could also post other images. So if we want to post a Google image, uh, we can also put that in here. So this is going to execute the same request with a different image URL. And now we have the Google image posted. Um, if we had two people connected to this at the same time, let's try that real quick. then ideally everybody who's connected to it uh, should receive the images at the same time. So the cool thing about Node.js is that you could probably have a few hundred users using this at any given time. It wouldn't cost much resources uh, to be used on your web server. Um, doing the same or similar thing on other platforms would be fairly hard because having all these active connections that don't send data through uh, is more difficult or uh, more difficult to do efficiently using threads and uh, nodes programming model makes it pretty simple. Um, how we're we doing for time? I think I have a little time to try uh, one more thing. Uh, I also said that I would try to uh, use some uh, other programs on my computer and execute those programs to get some work done, which is the main idea behind Unix. I mean, you're supposed to write small tools that do one thing well and then keep reusing them. Uh, and instead, what has the web community done? We've done bindings for all the platforms, for all the libraries, and re-implemented all these tools or at least interfaces for them over and over again. Well, with Node, it's actually pretty easy to take a command line tool and uh, reutilize it. So what we could do is we could go back and write some code again. Um, so what we want to do as a goal is so those images that come on, we all want them in a standard size. So we want all of them to be, uh, let's say, exactly 200 pixels high, or let's say 500 pixels. And we want to resize them. Every time somebody submits URL, we want to resize that image, put it on our file system, and then serve it from there. Um, so we're going to get a little utility called exec. This is actually part of the node core. Uh, it's a function that lets us shell out and run a comment through bash. Um, and so every time we're going to get an image, uh, we're going to shell out uh, and execute a comment. So the comment we're going to do is we're going to uh, call curl, and uh, we're going to give curl a URL. And the URL uh, is a request body URL. So let's get a reference to that real quick. So we're going to say curl, and we're going to give it a URL. And then curl is going to download that image and uh, print the data to standard out. And now what we can do is we can take this data and put it into another comment. Uh, this one is from Image Magic. It allows us to convert images. And the dash right here says, please use the data coming out of curl that goes into your standard input as the input. And then we want to resize this image. And we want it to be 500 pixels tall. We're not going to specify a height, uh, a width. And um, we need some output paths. So let's say we're going to create a path. So the path is going to be uh, in our dir in our current directory. Uh, we want it to be in the public folder. We want it to be in slash image. And uh, then we want uh, date.now to be the file name. So this is not very sophisticated. If somebody managed to get two image in, images in at the same millisecond, uh, they're going to overwrite. But let's assume this doesn't happen uh, for simplicity. Um, we probably want this part of the URL uh, to be stored in a, a separate variable. So. Uh, so let's do that. So let's call that the file URL. Uh, and that's because that's the URL, the new URL we're going to broadcast to all our clients. So the file URL is slash image and then just the timestamp. Uh, the path to that is the current directory we are in, then slash public, and then slash image and the uh, date now thing. And uh, now we need to execute this comment. This is as simple as calling exec comment. Uh, again, we are passing in, in such a callback function that's going to notif notify us when we executed our program. Um, this one is going to give us an error argument. If that argument is set, it contains an error object. And for this program, we just want to crash and be like, what happened, and analyze that. Um, 
If nothing bad happened, then we want to send our 204 response. And we probably also want to let everybody know that a new image came in and we finished resizing it. So we're going to be io.socketsemit image and then file URL. So the only thing I think is left is inside our public folder. We need to create that image folder. Otherwise, we won't be able to put files in it. And if we're lucky, this could work. So let's try it out. Let's get one of these web browsers in our view again. And it always works better when I actually start the program I'm, program I'm talking about. So let's start the oops, chat server again. It's loading. And now we would uh, execute the curl request again. If it's working right away, we should see the Google logo again, but this time uh, much higher because it has been resized. Seems to work. So now every image that goes in here uh, is being resized to be much taller. And we, we could also change our program uh, to make something really small again. So instead of 500 pixels height, we could also say, hey, we want really small images today because those are going to fit better on our screen. And we could retry this. Um, and now all the images would be resized to be smaller. So to me, this shows some of the benefits of using Node. Uh, it's fairly easy to write small programs with it that do something. Uh, there's a good package management system. Uh, it's easy to call out to other uh, applications, so such as uh, uh, the image magic program and the curl program here that people have with beards have written years and years ago and made perfect. Uh, we don't have to reinvent all that crap. And uh, Node makes it easy to build on top of that. And uh, Node also makes it easy to do the WebSocket stuff. Uh, if we had more time, I could also show you how we could now uh, create a little web interface where you have a little input field and a submit button, but where we can submit our URLs. Uh, I'm sure most people could imagine that. Or we could look at how we can share code. Um, so that is, I think, the only thing that we're not going to get to that I kind of regret. Uh, with Node, it's also easy to write some JavaScript code on your server and then later on reuse that exact same code on the client. So if you would write some validation code in this example that makes sure, is this a valid URL? You could write that code once, execute it on the server whenever somebody tries to post an image. If the uh, URL parameter is not a proper URL, you would reject the request. But at the same time, you could use that validation logic on the client for people hitting the submit button and wouldn't even let them go to the server if they don't pass the validation rules. So you can write code once and run it anywhere. Um, it's pretty much what I have for today. Uh, but hopefully there are some questions. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? Raise your hand. Yeah, questions. Uh, thank you. Hey. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how is Node.js uh, works with MVC patterns and how to scale it to meet a uh, large sized uh, server applications? Are there any uh, frameworks based on this or how, how is it done in this field? Okay. Thank you. So you're asking, uh, how does it, are there any good MVC frameworks, basically? Uh, so at this point, if you're looking for something that is as sophisticated as Rails or some of the PHP frameworks, I think one was presented before me, uh, the answer is no. Um, this has two reasons, really. First, Node is a little bit of a younger, young platform compared to others. So uh, people have not written uh, as much full stack frameworks. The other reason is that the Node community is a little different. Uh, instead of writing these monolithic uh, MEC frameworks and trying to fit huge amounts of business logic into this one big project, uh, people tend to try to split things up. So everything that's not core business logic would go into an NPM module. And instead of taking all of these together into one framework, people prefer to pick uh, and choose pieces. That being said, if you have an inexperienced development team, this is going to be a nightmare for you. Uh, if you have very experienced developers, you may be very happy with this approach. Um, but then again, you can also have experienced developers take one of these huge MVC frameworks and create a mess. I've done it. Uh, but the answer is no. If you're looking for that at this point, don't use Node. I wouldn't recommend it. More questions? There's one over here. 
Uh, thanks. I want to ask you, is, uh, what's your opinion about Meteor GS? And are there any kind of apps you wouldn't write in Node.js? Uh, Meteor JS is a question. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Meteor JS is the guys who just took like 20 million in funding to develop a framework or something. I think that's crazy. I think you should have like a real world problem and then solve that and not ask somebody for money to build a framework with 20 million dollars. Uh, so I'm very skeptical about what can come out of it. Um, that being said, I haven't used it. My only skepticism comes from the fact how they approach the problem of creating a framework. I think people need to create those out of necessity uh, and maybe do some consulting work or something where they actually dock food set all the time and I'm doubtful the Meteor people will do it. Uh, the second part of the question was, uh, are there any kind of applications that I wouldn't recommend uh, doing in Node? Um, I'm a little bit of a Node fanboy, so I do a lot of things in Node, even if you shouldn't do them. I've written uh, an alarm clock that wakes me up in the morning in Node. Uh, I'm programming uh, helicopters, AR drones with it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend you to use Node for most of this stuff. Um, if, if you're looking for a definite anti-use case, uh, I think it's anything that's really real-time, hot real-time. So where you are obligated to respond to a request in a fixed amount of time, let's say five milliseconds, and you can never miss that deadline, otherwise the request is going to be worthless. Uh, Node is not good for that. That's because it's a dynamic language and it has garbage collection. So your program could be stopped for a short amount of time at any given point. So if you need to write a real real-time system, don't use Node. If you need to write a soft real-time system where basically just get this in front of people as fast as possible, oh my god, it's just a tweet or something, then Node is pretty good for that. But there's a pretty big distinction between those two problem domains. As you mentioned, it's a really young project, so I um, ask myself, what about security? Like, the code you wrote looked uh, really vulnerable. Like, you just get the URL and pass it to curl. Yeah. That. So, I would say security is a problem. Um, if only by the fact that people like this modularity, and when you pick your own components and you compose them yourself, it's easy to forget to escape some data, uh, easy to make mistakes that you wouldn't make if you're in a more uh, monolithic framework that takes care of this. Um, I would say you will need a good security background and you shouldn't use code like, like this that I've wrote today uh, and assume it is secure. Uh, you'll have to apply your own security. There's people who have written modules, obviously, that deal with escaping, that help you with certain security problems, with SQL injections, whatever you have. Um, but you will have to find these modules, determine that you need them, determine where you need to put them in. And Node itself is not going to help you. It's just a programming platform. And I don't think there's a framework that's going to make that disappear and abstract away quite nicely either. That being said, security is nothing you can fully abstract away. I mean, it's always going to be tricky to get right. But I think with Node, you have to pay a little bit more attention than with other platforms at this point. Um, since we are talking about uh, JavaScript on a server, we are obviously talking about debugging. And yes. uh, I wanted to ask you how you feel about Dart, because unlike B8, uh, Google, uh, in, in connection with Dart, uh, provided libraries. Uh, in order to do what Node basically does? So uh, the question is, how do I feel about Dart? And uh, do you think, I mean, um, yeah, working with Node, large code base, I, I mean, as you say, it's a young, young thing. Yeah. So the code bases often, I think, are not that large. Uh, the larger they get, the more problems we face. Sure. So, so, so overall, uh, I've not used Dart much, but I very much like the idea of having uh, optional type annotations in a dynamic language. So I can use uh, a more strict form of typing when I want to, and I can stay in the dynamic world when I want to. And Dart seems to aim at that problem space. Uh, I've not used it, so I can't really comment how well it does, but I'm excited about Dart, and hopefully it will go somewhere. Uh, and uh, on the note side, uh, what what is your recommendation about, you know, uh, or what do you think about larger code bases and um, So for, for larger code bases on the node side, lots of unit testing. Write a lot of tests. So if you want to make sure that you get notified when some interface breaks, there needs to be a test to tell you. Otherwise, you won't know about that in a dynamic language. Also write integration tests. I mean, you, you'll have to do more of this test writing, I think, in a dynamic language, especially JavaScript, than you would in a statically typed one. And so write enough tests if you want to feel good about a bigger project uh, and a bigger code base. But it's certainly doable. We, we've got a bunch of lines of code in production.
I, I missed your talk, but uh, enjoy very much uh, using your libraries. And um, what I want to ask you is more like your opinion about um, what we are doing over there is Social Quest. Um, so um, can you repeat that? What over there? We are doing Social Quest. It's over there. It's a experiment, a hacking experiment, like uh, developing in three days uh, Social Quest. What it is, I'll explain you over there. But we had uh, like no developers uh, in the morning and then started coding right away with uh, different languages and uh, then later asked the people what, like, what languages would you like to use or what frameworks. Um, the option was uh, Python, Ruby, Rails, and uh, Node.js. Uh, it was like close, Node.js and uh, Rails, but we decided to do uh, Ruby, Rails. Um, the the thing was uh, we decided to do uh, uh, with uh, Rails was because um, it's difficult to debug maybe tomorrow if the people who are working today are gone tomorrow and uh, the code come becomes un unreadable for the next uh, developer even if uh, you comment or something and uh, just want to ask you about your opinion what do you think about uh, the our decision okay so I don't know much about the uh, uh, hack hackathon you got going, but uh, feel free to talk to me after that. Uh, in general, about how I feel about um, a situation where new people are going to come into a code base and you want to optimize for that, I think using a framework is a way to go. It will create a common set of idioms, a common set of uh, folders and uh, file structure for you that everybody kind of knows, and so it's much easier for somebody new to come into a project. Um, you'll run into other pro problems with this approach eventually because you're going to try to fit everything into these idioms even if it doesn't fit well. But I think it's really good for uh, the general purpose uh, web projects. So the reason where I would see, uh, or where I would see Node uh, really come into play is if you need to talk to many data sources a asynchronously and in parallel, uh, that will be less fun to do, much less fun to do in Rails as it will be in Node. Just having a process that goes out and talks to a lot of different uh, TCP or uh, HTTP web resources and mixes them together. Okay, and uh, the the reason we uh, uh, was pro the the pro reasons for Node was um, that we had more uh, JavaScript developers. Yeah, that was really good. But all the JavaScript developers were um, uh, coming from the front end, or uh, it was JavaScript um, used here and there, not really uh, a good knowledge of uh, JavaScript. But uh, the other reason to do it with Ruby or Rails uh, was um, it's object-oriented, easier to read maybe, if you know how to work with Ruby. And that was actually the pro to use Ruby and then the final decision to do it because uh, we uh, thought it's easier to find bugs or uh, understand the code. But my opinion is also, like, I prefer, I'm, I'm going with the hype, I like it. But uh, just wanted to share with you my opinion, and uh, thanks for your opinion, too. Sure. Uh, one last thing about front-end developers. I think Node is both scary and amazing. Uh, front-end developers who've never done back-end stuff can get into it. They're probably not going to write great projects right away, but it lowers the barrier of entry. So that is good, and uh, we'll hopefully have good results a few years down the line when front-end people uh, are more integrated with the back-end teams. Ideally, there shouldn't be that distinction to me to run successful projects. Hi, I, um, I'm, I'm just starting a WebSockets project, uh, but using Tornado. And um, when I first heard of Node.js, uh, I actually thought the, the exact opposite. I was thinking, JavaScript on the back end, that's kind of scary. <laughs> and I'm just wondering um, if you have any particular selling points on, on Node.js um, itself rather than just WebSockets in general. Is there anything that, that Node.js Node has that would be a benefit over another WebSocket-based yeah. framework? Sure. So uh, he, 
The question was, uh, what advantages does Node.js have, have for WebSockets on platforms like Python that also have asynchronous uh, implementations, like I think there's Tornado, Tornado and Twisted, right? Um, so the main benefit Node has for these platforms is that JavaScript doesn't have a standard library. So every piece of code that you're going to get from NPM is going to be written in this non-blocking asynchronous way. Uh, in Python, if you're going to pull in a library uh, in a WebSocket project with uh, Tornado or Twisted, you'll have to make sure that this library doesn't use some of Python's standard library that issues blocking calls because you're single-threaded. So if, if one of these uh, libraries you include goes and makes an HTTP request in a blocking way, your whole program will hang while this happens. So you essentially need to audit everything that you plan to pull in a, to the project. That's my one point. With Node, uh, for the better or worse, there is no blocking. Uh, and you're not going to have to watch this carefully with the libraries you use. Uh, the second point is uh, a friend of mine actually uh, has a pretty performance intense project right now. It's not WebSocket, but he also uh, uses, tried to use Twisted Python um, and he tried to use Node.js. Um, he, he really liked Python a lot more as a language than JavaScript, but uh, Node.js version was uh, easily two times faster without him applying special optimizations. So this may not hold true for your use case. Just a single example. Hi, I wanted to ask if there are some special points you can name you have to take care of uh, when using uh, Node.js in a product productive environment, like uh, debugging and um, or yeah, like monitoring if your server is still working and stuff like that. Sure. So are there any special things for monitoring and running Node apps in production, basically? Um, a few things. So uh, Node is asking you to create your own web server. So the first problem you're going to run into, how do I listen on port 80? To listen on port 80, you need to be root. Do, you wanna, do I want to run my application as root? Probably not. So you, you have a few choices there. You can either drop root privileges after you uh, open up port 80 and then become another user with your process. Uh, you can use IP tables to forward port 80 to some non-privileged port. Uh, you could use a load balancer or reverse proxy in front of Node.js. People use all, all of these things. It depends on your use case. Uh, as far as monitoring, you need to monitor a node like any other daemon that you run. So if node crashes, something needs to monitor over it and keep restarting it. Um, if you're on Solaris, uh, on SmartOS, the joint people have developed some great stuff for debugging. I think that was the last element. Uh, they can actually uh, take a, a full, full dump of the running process when it goes down. And then you can later on analyze the heap and see what, al what objects were accumulated in the heap and what was going on the moment your program crashed. On Linux, it's not quite that nice, but you're going to get a stack trace. And if you use a long stack trace module, it's even going to be meaningful. Um, so. I think those are the high-level pointers. If you want to know more, you can catch me afterwards and we can chat. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, then thanks again, everybody.